This is a love story, but don't expect a happily ever after. Not when it entangles one of this country's biggest drug lords and his young lover. Blonde, beautiful and bloody-minded, prepared to calmly organise the execution of two innocent men. It's a soap opera-like saga spanning seven years. Love letters, secretly recorded phone calls, an arrest on a crowded city street, jail sentences and betrayal. It's the story of Charlotte's Web. Charlotte Lindstrom hails from a middle-class suburb in Stockholm, Sweden. Her parents would later say she had no particular ambition, she just wanted to be special. When Charlotte was 19, she came to Australia with a group of school friends and met Stephen Spellavero, an older man by 18 years. Stephen and Charlotte's love story began when she was working on the door at a gentleman's club that Stephen owned. Charlotte had expensive tastes and Stephen funded her love of all things designer. Within months, the pair was living together in a waterfront suburb of Sydney. Then two years into their romance, Stephen Spallaviero had made it onto the police radar, all because of a phone call, not to police, but to the fire brigade. Emergency police, a fire or ambulance. The fire brigade is being called to an industrial estate in the western Sydney suburb of Riverston. Fire brigade then got a phone call on Triple O from a male who said that he was at the premises and that the secretary had rung up mistakenly thinking that there was a fire and there actually wasn't. Uh, fire, police. What the people right, telling is the emergency. A fire brigade. Police would later discover the mystery caller is Stephen Spellavero. The fire brigade uh, told him, no, sorry, mate, we've got to come and have a look anyway. We've had a report of a fire. But Stephen Spellavero is not finished yet. He tries again to divert the fire brigade, this time with a fake blaze. <laughs> Can I help you? Yes, sir. I'd like to report a bus fire at uh, Windsor Road. Uh, it's, a, it's like a car or something. Okay. But it's too late. The fire brigade turned up and uh, still fearing that there was a fire inside, um, they used some bolt cutters and cut through the padlock on the gate and then broke into the factory. No fire, but something Stephen Spellavero didn't want the fire brigade or police to ever see. And found what they believed to be a drug lab. And it was enormous. One of the most sophisticated, extensive setups police had ever seen. This is the actual police footage from the crime scene. When I first walked in, I was shocked at the pure scale and the size of the equipment inside the laboratory. Large stainless steel vessel, out of 300 litre. Those vessels would be used to mix the substances to make drugs. Working in the area of drug labs for so long, if we found a lab that had a, a 20 litre uh, reaction flask, we were quite excited. We considered that to be a large lab. There were three 300 litre stainless steel vessels and a large 780 litre vessel. Another thousand litre plastic drum, browny coloured liquid, which looks like it has a an oily scum on top. There were two 50 litre beer kegs on the ground with specially manufactured condensers attached to them that were undergoing distillation at the time, so the drug was being distilled. But it's what police are about to find upstairs that will really surprise them. On the ground was some electric blankets covered in orange plastic on top of the orange plastic was uh, this brown powder, which turned out to be uh, MDMA or ecstasy. Um, there's about six kilos just laying there drying. The electric blankets were turned on. Six kilograms of pure ecstasy. Bag after bag of drugs packed as evidence. 1.140 kilos. Police are far from over. In the room next to the orange plastic were three tablet presses. One of them had some powder in one of the hoppers, so it was ready to, uh, to press some tablets out. This is where the ecstasy pills would be pressed and stamped. The whole process from 
um, taking the precursor chemical through to the final drug and um, leaving there as a, a marketable product on the street was all taking place within the lab. In the vessels downstairs, the drugs would be brewed. The ecstasy would be dried on the orange plastic before being fleshed out with other chemicals and pressed into a tablet form. And the amounts of drugs are massive. All up, police find 40 kilograms of pure ecstasy. That would be worth $127 million. I, I knew I probably wouldn't see another drug lab that size. It was, um, it was massive. It takes police two days to package up all the evidence, including any clues. Police confiscate a pair of Louis Vuitton shoes and a gas mask. These items will later become crucial to the drug investigation, one of the biggest Australia has ever seen. Then police find a lease for the property. We also got in contact with a real estate agent in Riverston who leased the premises and he had told us that he had leased it to a company called K&M uh, Machinery and the signature of the leasee was John Walker. And it was a, a false address um, and checks that we'd made on our own uh, police computer system. Uh, John Walker, as far as we were concerned, did not exist. He didn't have a driver's licence, he didn't have a home address. Um, so straight away I started to think that uh, it was a false name. John Walker is an alias. It's not long before police get a tip-off. The man using the alias is, in fact, Stephen Spellavero. Over the next 12 months, detectives desperately try to get evidence on Stephen. They tap his phones, gather intelligence on him. They know where he's living and with whom, his lover, Charlotte Lindstrom. Detectives also go to a company that makes the equipment found in the lab to see if anyone can identify Stephen Spalavero as the drug lord. A number of workers at the machinery factory remember selling the same equipment that was in the drug lab to a man called John Matthews. John Matthews, or Stephen Spalavero, purchased that much equipment that he was actually added to the Christmas card list. Police show the witnesses a list of photos, asking them to pick John Matthews. They make their selection. They had identified Stephen Spalavero as the man they know as John Matthews. I knew I was probably getting close to being able to charge Stephen Spalavero with the, with the lab at Riverston. The workers from the machinery company are prepared to testify against Stephen Spalavero. They become the key witnesses in the drug case. Their evidence could see Stephen Spellavero put away for life. With that, police get a warrant to search his apartment in inner Sydney. This is the actual police footage. Opening the door is his fiancée, Charlotte Lindstrom. Hello. Hello. Hello, we're just from the police. Is there anyone else home here at the moment? No. Do you mind if we just come in and have a quick look? No, um, no, I'm just coming. I have a search warrant for the premises. I'm just, we are going to come in and see if there are any other people home. It's just you, is it? Yeah. At the time I executed the warrant, he wasn't there. He was fishing. We're here looking for Stephen Spalavero. Do you know where he is at the moment? He's on holiday. Whereabouts is he? He's in Cooktown. His Swedish girlfriend, Charlotte Lindstrom, was the only person home. With me, I have Miss Charlotte Lindstrom, the occupier of the premises. Charlotte, I'll just show you the search. This is a, a valid search warrant for the premises. So what are you here for? Can I just ask? Yeah, but it's just, if you just, that's that one here. This is what, in particular, we're looking for, but it's not limited to what is listed there either. She appeared to be quite confident that the police wouldn't find anything to implicate uh, Mr. Spalavero in any drug lab. But what does Charlotte really know? Is there something to find? Something even she doesn't know about? Somewhere in this suburban apartment could be the clue. The clue to tie Stephen Spalavero to the biggest ecstasy lab in Australian history. Police are in the middle of a search of an apartment in inner Sydney. It belongs to Stephen Spellavero. Police have tapped his phone. They believe Spellavero is responsible for a multi-million dollar drug laboratory found in Sydney's western suburbs. 
Stephen Spallavero was uh, well spoken, well dressed, polite, but I found him in the time that I, that I got to know him over the, the following 18 months. He was very manipulative and egotistical. But Stephen Spellavero is away fishing in North Queensland. It's a holiday. The only person home is his 20 year old fiance, Charlotte Lindstrom. You want me back? And now she is watching as police turn their love nest upside down, looking for any proof her Romeo is a drug lord. In particular, anything that links Stephen to the drug lab at Riverston or the aliases that were used. We were more looking for evidence of the use of aliases, um, any business cards in those names, which we knew that he had. Police scour the house. With Charlotte looking on, police make a find, high on a shelf. Just appears to be a amount of cash underneath a pair of uh, gloves. Several thousand dollars by the look of it. But Stephen and Charlotte have expensive tastes. That could be just pocket money. Detectives continue to go through the house, moving into the bedroom, checking underneath right. the mattress. Hang on. Oh. Everywhere police go, Charlotte follows, shadowing their search. No, I'm not breaking the china. No, that's, yeah, just be careful with that because that's, um, that's solid. I thought you were worried about your shoes. Oh, yeah, I'm worried about the shoes too. <laughs> then, under the television cabinet, a box. There's nothing inside, but the box itself is a find for police. Just for the record. This is a brown cardboard box just located by Detective Bennett in the cupboard here. The box is for a pair of size 9 Louis Vuitton men's shoes. And police have seen shoes like this before. Remember? From the multi-million dollar drug lab. When we executed the search warrant on that date, there was a Louis Vuitton shoe box for those joggers in a size 9 in the house. We weren't searching for that. That was more of a, a bonus thing that you come across when you're doing uh, search warrants. Police are having those shoes forensically examined, hoping to get DNA from them. DNA that could bring down Stephen Spellavero. Police have failed to find in the apartment any evidence that Stephen Spellavero has used the aliases. We did a fairly thorough search and we came up with nothing. But police do have enough to arrest Stephen. They have the two witnesses, the workers from the machinery company who are prepared to testify against Stephen Spellavero, and their evidence would link him to the lab. Police leave their details with Charlotte, asking her to get Stephen to phone them when he returns from his fishing trip. Got a phone call on my mobile phone, and it was from Stephen Spellavero. I recognised the voice almost instantly after months of listening to him on our telephone intercepts. He wasn't real keen to meet me at a police station. He thought that we could just get together for a coffee and uh, sort it out. He, he attempted to, to manipulate me into to not making him come to a police station and, and not me not arresting him. Um, I really had to explain to him that that wasn't the case and, and regardless, he was going to be arrested for the offence. The very next day, Stephen Spellavero, knowing that police are not open to negotiations, turns himself in. He is arrested. Stephen Spellavero is charged with manufacturing a large commercial quantity of a prohibited drug. He will have to stay in Silverwater Jail until his next court hearing. The most damning evidence police have is the testimony of two witnesses, the workers from the company that sold the equipment police found in the laboratory. They are prepared to identify Spellavero as being the man who bought the drug-making equipment, and their evidence could put him away for life. From jail, Stephen Spellavero is in constant contact with his fiancée, Charlotte Lindstrom. But this drug case is about to take a massive turn. A prisoner has information for police. He claims the lives of the two witnesses are now in jeopardy. The prisoner claims a hit is going to be carried out by two men from Victoria, 
One, a convicted armed robber who was sentenced to four years jail. The other, a petty thief. They were going to be killed at closing time at the factory and it was going to look like an armed robbery that had gone wrong. The prisoner goes on to tell police the hitmen have been building a dossier on the victims, collecting photos and documents, including a map he claimed had been written by Stephen Spallavero. We received word from our prison informant that Stephen Spallavero had handed him a, a mud map or a hand-drawn map of the machinery company where the two proposed victims worked. It's an explosive claim, and with two lives possibly at risk, police put the machinery company where the two men work under surveillance, just in case the alleged hitmen from Victoria turn up. We put surveillance on the machinery company in the afternoon, uh, around closing time from probably two o'clock till six o'clock, just to see whether we could see anything that was unusual. Detective Waring and I were actually sitting outside the machinery company, and I think this was probably the turning point, and a Victorian registered car pulled up at five past five in the afternoon, which was closing time. I look at the car, I look at the number plate, and I turned to Detective Hancock and said, that's got a Victorian plate on it. As I'm staring over the back of the car, I can see two people inside the car. About 30 seconds later, Detective Hancock's mobile phone rings. The people inside the machinery company rang me almost immediately after this car drove off and said, we've just had a phone call. And the person on the phone asked for the two gentlemen that were the intended victims. When we told them that these victims weren't there, they hung up. I think that was when it all came uh, to the realisation for me that it was actually, it was probably true. Just disbelief. It was total disbelief. I mean, I still get tingling on the back of my neck when I think about that afternoon, because it was just so surreal. The machinery company also disclosed to me that they'd received a number of other strange phone calls around closing time previously. On each of these occasions, the person on the phone would ask for either of the intended victims, and when they were told that they weren't there or weren't available, they'd just hang up. We'd already obtained the registration of that vehicle, and when we got back to the office, we did a, a number of checks, and the offender was silly enough or stupid enough to, to drive his own car that was registered to him. So from that point on, we, we had a suspect. The threat seems real. Stephen Spellavero is still in prison, and he knows every phone call he makes is monitored. It was very hard to ascertain what they spoke about because they used a lot of different uh, codes. From those calls, police learned Charlotte is meeting up with one of the men she believes will do the hit. And police are watching. Charlotte has no idea police have infiltrated her web and the detectives are about to get the ultimate proof she's plotting a double murder. Police are watching as Swedish socialite Charlotte Lindstrom walks down a street in Sydney City. She's with one of two men who she believes will murder two witnesses prepared to testify against her boyfriend, Stephen Spellavero. He's accused of being a drug lord, responsible for a $127 million drug laboratory. But now, there's been a change of plan. The hit has been taking too long. Charlotte believes she's found a new hitman, someone else to carry out the killings and no longer needs the services of the two Victorian men. The pair were paid in advance, given $100,000. In that white shopping bag is $70,000, a refund. This is the actual audio of Charlotte telling Stephen in jail what's happening with the money. So is everything all right? Yeah, no, no. Did you work the bill out with her? No, she, she gave me $70 now and she's going to give me another 30 Oh, OK. Well, that's all right. Yeah. Yeah. When? Saturday. Oh, good. OK, excellent. All right. Even though the Victorian men are no longer involved, police are convinced there is still a plan to murder the two witnesses. With the lives of two men on the line, investigators can't take any chances. They keep listening to all the conversations, everything Charlotte says. Through her phone, we've got a lot of information uh, encoded messages from Stephen. It was very hard 
to ascertain what they spoke about because they used a lot of different uh, codes. In one conversation submitted as evidence, Stephen and Charlotte talk about the solicitor, as they call him. Now that is one of the codes. Charlotte would later tell the court she believed solicitor meant hitman. If you need to see the solicitor, you're going to have to get everything ready, you know? Yeah, well, it's ready in, as soon as it arrives in the mail. Okay, all right. Yeah, but I can't do more than wait for paperwork, and I'm yeah, seeing him today, so. Okay. He's going to let me know what I need to do, so that's what we're going to do. Oh, you're going to call, call him later? But without knowing for sure what codes the pair are using, it's still not enough for officers. Nothing had come out to say, I want them killed. For police to make an arrest, they need to be entirely sure. They must be patient. They listen to conversation after conversation. Until finally, this. Do you know, does he want these people in a hospital? Does he want them in a cemetery? She said in the cemetery, so she wanted them killed. In my cemetery. It was 100% confirmed for me that this was certainly going to happen. She was serious. She, she meant to kill the two witnesses. I was shocked that someone would just try and kill uh, two completely innocent people that didn't even have a, a traffic ticket between them. I think you've got calls coming up pretty soon. So. She's quite willingly participating in it. She wanted those people killed. Police have no doubt Charlotte is conspiring to kill the men. And the enormity of organising the hit is taking its toll on the young socialite. She phones her lover, Stephen, in jail. How are you? I don't want to be here. Huh? I don't want to be here anymore. Where are you? I'm in the city. What's wrong, baby? <laughs> Nothing. This is funny. Huh? I don't think this is funny. Oh, no, honey, I'm sorry. Put you through, but that's it now. Listen, I'm gonna go, eh? I'll leave Why? you alone because you're upset. So you're gonna just leave me when I'm upset? No, I'm just saying, you know, talking. Like... Don't, I'm gonna sit and cry by myself. Just keep it together, huh? Yeah, no, I just don't wanna see those people, that's all. Just shut up. Talking rubbish about fucking shit, yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. I'll speak to you later, then. Bye. Naive. She was very naive. Charlotte is clearly distraught. She has crossed the line. It's it's almost disbelief that it, it's occurring, that, that she's actually going to have these innocent people killed. Police have a plan. What happens in the next 24 hours will change Charlotte's life forever. For months, police have been watching and listening as Charlotte Lindstrom plans a double murder. The targets, two witnesses whose damning evidence could send her boyfriend to jail for life. Police have heard Charlotte planning the contract killing. Officers finally have all the evidence they need. May 2007, time to tear apart Charlotte's web. She had committed a very serious offence, so um, she had to be arrested. It's mid-morning in Sydney's CBD. Charlotte has no idea she's being watched or what's about to happen. Charlotte Lindstrom, arrested, handcuffed in broad daylight. The well-heeled Swedish beauty accused of organising a cold-blooded killing. Four years after they first met and Charlotte's blinded love and willingness to do anything for Stephen has led to her arrest. Back home in Sweden, her parents have no idea what's been going on. Charlotte didn't even tell them Stephen was in jail. Charlotte knew what would have happened. They never liked Stephen and her parents would demand she come home. 
For love-struck Charlotte, that wasn't going to happen. She kept up the glamorous socialite facade. And just one week before her public arrest, Charlotte gloated to her mum about a new job in an upmarket restaurant. It was a journalist who told the Lindstroms their little girl had been arrested. With Charlotte in custody, police hit her fiancé Stephen Spellavero's cell for any evidence linking him to the planned killings. We're going to take everything out, the briefs, everything. Take all? Yep. So I found my diary. This was in the, the end tub with the various food products. It's, um, it's got various notes in it. In the front of it there, names and phone numbers. In his cell, they find photographs of Charlotte, memories of a life now so far away for them both. We also, at that point, informed him of, of our investigation to date and that we had arrested uh, Charlotte Lindstrom sometime earlier. Charlotte's been arrested in town. Is this? They were organising to kill. When was that? Today. What's today? Myself and Tippy Senior Constable Hancock. You already know her. We're going to speak to you later in the week, OK? Where all the evidence that we've got will be shown to you uh, and you'll be charged for yes. conspiracy or solicit to murder. Do you understand that? Has Charlotte been charged? Yes, she will be charged. OK? okay. While police finish up with Stephen in his cell, other detectives are with his girlfriend Charlotte. She's been searched at the police station and now detectives have taken her back to the apartment she once shared with Stephen Spellavero to search for any further evidence. First, more money. $1,000. Next, the bedroom. There's a uh, small notebook, top drawer, left-hand side of the cupboard. Not First only are police looking for evidence that Charlotte was organising the contract kill, they're searching for anything that could still tie Stephen Spellavero to the multi-million dollar ecstasy lab. Charlotte is still watching on as police find a book. Under that. K and M, Kilo and Mike, Engineering. Uh, it's hard to read, maybe the 19th of October, 2005, a further phone number. The name in the book is a match for the fake company name that Stephen Spellavero used on the lease for the multi-million dollar drug lab. Next, private declarations of love. A two-page handwritten note addressed to Charlotte begins just a short note to say hi and tell you how much I love you. This note will be seized. The love letter is now a police exhibit. Charlotte has to sit and watch as police dissect her home and her love life. Next, they find a letter from her fiancé, Stephen Spellavero. How have I done? I believe it's Steve. It was written by Stephen on a flight back from Sweden after meeting Charlotte's family. It was penned before he was arrested for the massive drug lab, before Charlotte organised the killings. It was written with the intention they would live happily ever after. I just want everything to be perfect. I want to go all the way with this and build a perfect life in our beautiful home. I love you and will do anything to make this work. But even love has its limits. Charlotte, knowing she faces prison time, agrees to betray her lover. Reveal to police intimate details of Stephen's million dollar drug enterprise. You're about to see Charlotte Lindstrom go from socialite to criminal to informant. On a busy street in Sydney's CBD, a young socialite, Charlotte Lindstrom, has been dramatically arrested by police. 
She was plotting to have two witnesses killed. They're going to testify against her boyfriend, suspected drug lord Stephen Spellavero. Charlotte pleads guilty and, while awaiting sentencing, is jailed. Her boyfriend Stephen and the two alleged contract killers from Melbourne are also charged with conspiring to kill the two witnesses. Stephen Spellavero and the two Victorian men plead not guilty and go to trial. The jury has played footage of Charlotte organising the contract kill and hears the phone conversations between Stephen and Charlotte. But Stephen maintains he was just trying to discredit the witnesses, dig up dirt on them, not have them killed. He is adamant Charlotte acted alone. A jury agrees. After 48 hours of deliberation, Stephen Spellavero and the two men from Melbourne are found not guilty of organising a contract killing. Spellavero's lawyer issues a statement that while Charlotte acted on her own, Stephen acknowledged she was motivated by love. But police are not finished yet. Stephen Spellavero is still accused of being a drug lord. There's still the matter of the multi-million dollar drug lab and they have damning new evidence to bring him down. Charlotte has committed the ultimate act of betrayal. She's done a deal with police to give evidence against her former lover in the hope of a lighter sentence. Charlotte will spill the beans on Stephen's massive drug operation and not just the ecstasy lab at Riverston. The assistance that she gave me and the statement that she gave me were brilliant and um, corroborated a large amount of evidence that I gathered in relation to, to the other drug labs that uh, I ended up charging him with. Her memory uh, and recollection of her time with Stephen Spallavira was spot on. I drove around Sydney with Miss Lindstrom in the car and uh, took her to the addresses and she explained where Mr Spellavira had certain things set up, um, what things looked like, what they were doing, what he was doing. Handcuffed, Charlotte takes police to a number of different sites that at one time had been used by Spellavero. Charlotte, what can you tell me about this factory that we're at here? Maybe two minutes I was inside because Steve just wanted to show me the place, but I believe that was after he was doing the drugs when they were cleaning it up. But it was to this lab I was cooking a lot of food for them. Oh, OK. You, you recognise this address here, Charlotte? Have you been here before? Yes. I recognise the game. So you would have walked through this yeah. way? Is that, is that true? And, yeah. and yet another really clandestine like drug lab location. I think it was one, some type of things going on around there as well. But, okay. And then I think the machinery was kind of in the area of the Okay. What can you tell me about where Steve was going to set certain things up here? What he explained to you when he was here? Well, he was talking about that he was going to get a fan, uh, a fan to get out because the air was really bad and they had to work with a closed door. Yeah. And then he was yes, he was walking around in that section a lot there with yeah. the sort of Santa Claus was hanging around, and also over there, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Swabbed the inside of the premises, and each of the premises uh, had residue and traces of prohibited drugs on the walls and air conditioning vents, window sills. Because as you conduct the process, uh, the chemicals uh, bubble and evaporate and then come to rest on, on pieces of the furniture. So for me to take her there and for her to confirm that and obviously offer to give evidence about her visits there with Steve, um, it allowed me to, to charge the Spellavira with those extra labs. Every minute of footage is damning evidence against one of the biggest drug lords in Australia. Police are lining up all their evidence to bring down Stephen Spellavero. Charlotte's testimony, the evidence of the two witnesses that Charlotte was planning to have killed, and now a breakthrough. Just when it couldn't get any worse for Stephen Spellavero the fresh evidence that even he didn't see coming. Swedish model Charlotte Lindstrom is in jail. For her own safety, she's in special protection in a men's prison in Sydney, awaiting sentencing for soliciting the murder of two men. On the other side of town, in another jail, is her one-time fiancé, Stephen Spellavero. He's up on drug charges for a $127 million ecstasy lab. And police now have the final pieces of the puzzle. 
the ultimate proof Stephen Spellavero was the drug lord responsible for the massive clandestine laboratory. Remember the designer shoes that police found at the lab? So a sample of his DNA was taken at that time to use as a comparison to some of the uh, profiles that we'd found inside some of the items at Riverston. If it came back as a positive uh, identification of Stephen Spellavero, I thought it would be the icing on the cake for the investigation. We determined that Mr Spellavero had the same DNA profile as the DNA recovered from the Louis Vuitton shoe. Police also tested the gas mask. Which had Stephen Spellavero's DNA on the inside. We did a further analysis on that respirator as a result of the DNA being found. And in the filters attached to the outside of the respirator, uh, we discovered that ecstasy was present in those filters. The only way that residue could be found in the filters was if he was standing over, physically standing over, the, the manufacture process or the reaction uh, whilst it was cooking. Police have everything they need to convict the drug lord. They have the phone conversation from Triple O on the night of the fire at the drug lab. They have the shoes, the mask. They have the testimony of two witnesses from a company that sells the equipment found in the lab. And they have the evidence from Charlotte Lindstrom. With such damning evidence, Stephen Spellavero pleads guilty to manufacturing a large commercial quantity of a prohibited drug. He was sentenced to more than 16 years jail. Charlotte called off her engagement, pleaded guilty to organising the contract kill of two witnesses, but in a bid for less time in prison, she testified against Stephen Spellavero. In court, where she's had to face Stephen, she's gotten quite emotional when talking about their relationship. Uh, it's obviously something that's, that's still quite raw for both of them. Her giving evidence against him is the only time that she's had a chance to see him since she was arrested back in 2007. Charlotte also goes to court for her own sentencing, for conspiring to kill two men. Today, a Supreme Court judge said there was no doubt she was acting under a form of duress and was being completely manipulated by her boyfriend. Justice Rothman said Lindstrom's state of mind at the time caused her to romanticise the relationship with her boyfriend. And because of that, she wasn't fully aware of the consequences of her actions. I don't think she could believe that she was in jail. She, she quite often complained about the conditions in jail. And on numerous occasions, I had to explain to her that she actually was in prison and that she had tried to kill two people just to bring her feet back down. She's just naive, young. She was easily distracted by Stephen Spallavero, and he took advantage of it. Miss Lindstrom has told us that, that she no longer has feelings for Stephen. Um, and that she's received uh, a couple of notes smuggled uh, within the jail uh, from him to her, uh, which she's handed over to the police. Um, and on those occasions, she said that she hasn't even read them. She, she doesn't want anything to do with him. Charlotte Lindstrom spent three years behind bars. Charlotte Lindstrom has been released from prison after serving three years. For this is a spectacular story. Yeah, Charlotte's 25 now. She went into jail at 22. She's done three years. The family can't wait to have her back. Impressively, these are very normal, middle-class Swedish family, absolutely rocked by this. But they said it either destroys you or it makes you stronger. And they've him, her mother ring has rung Charlotte every day for the past three years in prison and um, her got her through this. With her parents by her side, Charlotte went straight from prison to Sydney Airport and flew home to Sweden, still looking every bit the captivating socialite. They definitely, you know, he definitely still has some feelings for her. And I think sometimes when she speaks about Stephen, she's reserved with her feelings. She took home to Sweden baggage that cannot be packed or checked. Charlotte carried with her a lifetime of lessons learned.